You are watching Apostolic Radio Charlotte, Truth with the Power to Live It. Uh, also, uh, Sister Trina is going to be starting the uh, production process for the uh, Easter, Easter egg, chocolate egg fundraiser. So those of you who have, uh, are available, if you could talk to her about volunteering some with her and helping her. Um, Sister Trina has been so faithful to do this every year. And it's a lot of work. Amen. And we're thankful for all of you who help her. Um, we are reading uh, Proverbs chapter number 18. Also, there's a sign-up list out front for the chocolate eggs uh, for, for selling them. A lot of times it's repeat buyers and the like. So, uh, Proverbs 18, uh, verse number 1. A man who isolates himself seeks his own desire. That's a fancy way of saying when you isolate yourself, you usually do so for selfish reasons. You can come up with as highfalutin a reason as you want to. You can make it look pretty. You can even use some academic language. But when you go off by yourself, it's usually selfish. (laughs) Boy, I didn't get any agreement in this house on that one. (laughs) He rages against all wise judgment. Notice verse number 2. A fool has no delight in understanding, but in expressing his own heart. A fool has no delight in understanding, but rather that fool's delight is in what? In expressing his own heart. Somebody say, in Jesus' name. Somebody say, help me, Jesus. Say, I know that preacher has my number tonight. (laughs) Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Amen. I want to thank you all for coming out on Wednesday night. Uh, I know your flesh doesn't always want to come on Wednesday night. Sometimes your flesh would like to sit at the house. And, uh, but I do want to say uh, thank you to all, all of you who are so faithful to come. And it shows that you love the Word of the Lord. Um, it shows that you, you, you want to grow in your knowledge of the Word of the Lord. Of the Lord. Uh, we, we're in our third or fourth week of this talking about uh, marriage particularly. And uh, uh, up until this point, you could classify almost all of the teaching I have done kind of under um, a theme of a moral imperative. Uh, what we ought to be doing. How we ought to show love uh, one to another. Uh, that that expression of the biblical ideals of love, that love is kind and long-suffering, and all of these things, you, you, could, you could kind of classify them all under this idea of a moral imperative. You ought to do these things. You ought to be patient. You ought to be kind. You ought to be merciful. You ought to be... You get the idea. Uh, what I have not done... Uh, so much as, as give you any kind of um, toolkits to work from or any kind of skill sets to apply in your own uh, life and your own marriage. Uh, the reason why I have done this is because I'm a, I'm a preacher and preachers preach the Bible. And so we have to start with that moral, to, moral imperative of the, 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 the idea that we are to be a certain kind of person. Can I have an amen? You don't get to claim the name of Christ and just follow after every lust of your flesh. Can I have another amen? Uh, if you're going to claim the name of Christ, that means something. That means you should endeavor, as best as in you lie, to honor these things and show forth the love that God has shown to you. And uh, so that moral imperative is absolutely essential. It is foundational. Um, If people do not have a sense of their own need to be better, to do better, to walk right before their God, um, it's, it's, it's quite hard to make progress spiritually with them, uh, whether it's relative to their relationships or not. Uh, but tonight I want to take a little different slant on it. I, I, not, I don't want to just talk about moral imperatives. Uh, I want to kind of give you some, some technical skill sets uh, if possible. I, it's impossible to give a skill set in a 30-minute Bible study. But I, I'd like to give you some things you can think about and apply um, in, your own, in your own circumstances. I, I know, as I say every once in a while, I know not all of us are married. 
Uh, some of us are single and wish we were married, and some of us are married and wish we were single. Uh, we've got it all here. <laughs> uh, my point is these principles are beneficial in, wherever you find yourself in, uh, whether or not it's in a family relationship, whether or not it's in a sibling relationship, it changes, of course, and we would be remiss if we pretended it didn't. Uh, it, it does change, but the underlying principles are ever, are, are ever so true. And so I want to give you a few things to think about and apply in your own life as you uh, seek to build a better, stronger marriage. Uh, we read in Proverbs 18 about the man who is isolates himself, does of his own desire, he seeks his own desire, he rages against or argues with sound or wise judgment, uh, and a fool has no delight in understanding, uh, but what their delight really is in is, is saying what they think about everything. Um, if you have, if I, if I could say, and I've said this before, but I, I repeat myself as you have found, if I could pick one thing that would have a larger influence on your happiness in your life than anything else, anything else, more important than how uh, whether or not your career dreams work out, more important than whether or not you have a certain amount of money in the bank. I would say um, a, a joyful, successful, honorable marriage is as close as you can get to having a happiness crutch. I call it a happiness crutch. Um, a, a good marriage will make you happier than you would be without it. And uh, so... Uh, it is a it is something that's worth investing in. It's something it worth striving toward. It's something worth trying to uh, improve upon. Uh, one little example that you'll often hear people use. I've used it, and I'll do so again. That uh, marriage is is often like uh, an accounting of sorts. Um, like uh, a checking account that you have, and you, you put so much money into it, and then you start drawing on it. And there comes a point where if you don't put more money in it, you're going to bounce a check because you have spent all the money you have put in that. Uh, this is an imperfect metaphor because um, it, it, in a way it leads us to think in terms of people keeping account. Like, you've been ugly to me three times, the fourth time I'm going to slap you. That's not what I'm trying to advocate. But if we pretend that we can get away with just walking on people's feelings and disregarding people and being rude to people, it, I'm, I, I have a word for the, from the Lord for you. All that is not free. <laughs> Somebody's paying a price for you being ignorant. And uh, it may not be you yet, but... Like the old time preacher said, payday someday. <laughs> uh, let me give you four bad habits that I, uh, not just myself, but uh, humanity, uh, we see and if we're not careful, will work their way into our life. And uh, let me call them ruts. Uh, some, so many Times marriages get caught in bad habits, b b ruts, so to speak. You get stuck, and you respond over and over and over. And every time you do, the respect goes down a little bit. Um, every time you do, the, the affection goes down. Uh, there is duty in love, but if all you have in your love is duty, you've missed the point of love. There is duty in love, but if all you have today is duty, uh, somebody messed up in the past. Um, in the same manner that we did not, uh, most of us, uh, fall in love overnight, uh, we, we didn't fall out of love overnight. Uh, in other words, if you will make an effort, things will get better. If you will take some time, things will get sweeter. Uh, there is, and I, I'm just kind of, uh, kind of freelancing here for a minute before I get into my, my, uh, the things I have in my notes because uh, uh, there, there, there's a lot to be said that I, I won't even get to. But if you will make an effort, you will receive a benefit of that effort. Uh, and I think half of the benefit of any type of a marriage seminar or teaching or training is just to get people to start trying. 
Because truth is, if there was something seriously wrong with you in your marriage, it would have broke last year. <laughs> the, the more likely reality is that uh, there's a lot of things you can get right. There's a few things you can get wrong. But if you let that which is negative overwhelm that which is good, pretty soon you find yourself in a really, really uh, situation where you need an intervention or a miracle or an attorney or all three. <laughs> the first bad habit that people get into is the habit of escalation. Escalation is when one person says A, and the second person says A squared. And the third person says A cubed. And then the house burns down. Escalation is where you respond to an offense, a mistake, a thoughtless gesture. But you put some oomph in it. And then they respond and they put some oomph plus two in it. And pretty soon, uh, pots and pans are flying, and your neighbors are calling the police. Well, not really, but you get the idea. Marriages can get in habits of escalation. How dare you say that to me? Uh, I, I would, I would uh, say this is not simply uh, focused primarily on uh, men or women. I think both men and women can be guilty of this. I think men's escalation tends to come through anger, uh, and uh, women's escalation can often come through anger, but it can also come through a whole range of emotions, and you, uh, you know how you are. That's all I'm going to say. You know how you are. Escalation is the snowball effect, and pretty soon you're talking divorce over who left the milk out. Will somebody get out of middle school and throw out a sea anchor and stop this thing? You see what I'm saying? Um, escalation is a terrible habit. So I'd like you to think about this, since I'm kind of talking about some technical things here. I'd like you to think, how often in your marriage do uh, argu arguments start as one thing and end up seven miles down the road? Uh, probably... You probably don't fight all the time. I hope you don't. I think that's unhealthy. Um, but, <laughs> I mean, some people, they, they, they have personalities that's more inclined to that. But the, uh, God bless you. I mean, if you're like that, you just need a lot of prayer. I don't want to live my life that way. Uh, how often does it start one way, simple, and before you're done, you're seven streets down and three blocks over, and there's a body? <laughs> Do you, do you, uh, is it a natural, thoughtless reaction for you to punch back? I don't mean literally. I mean they hurt you somewhere, and instead of saying that hurts me, you try to hurt them back. It's the playground reality. You hit me, I hit you twice. Um, do you get hostile one with another? How does the fight usually end, and who's the first one to run up uh, 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 a white flag. There's no shame in being a peacemaker in a marriage because you're not enemies. God save us from a tough guy or a tough girl image where we, we, we have this sense, well, I'm not going to back down. Uh, that's like getting mad at your arm so you cut off your arm. The point is, is there, there's not, if, if, there, if in your marriage has turned into this tug of war, there's a, an emotional sense of that anytime there's a disagreement. But if that's all it is, if there isn't an effort to understand the whys and the what's of the involvement or the argument, um, you're, you're, you're probably suffering from this bad, bad rut, this bad habit of escalation. And I would say this to you, every time you escalate, you reinforce the bad habit, and it makes it easier the next time. Every time you let the temper fly and the words go, it makes it easier to happen the next time. Um, and if you got in that bad of a fight over who left the lid off the toothpaste, imagine if your marriage is going to survive when something really serious comes. Because there are 
difficult blows that can come to us in this life. There is terrible tragedies. And we need to be building the kind of marriage that doesn't depend on sunshine and flowers to make it. We need to have a strong foundation. And so rather than escalate, we need to get some discipline to de-escalate. Rather than raising the volume, we need to get in the business of lowering the volume. The second bad, bad habit that's a rut that I see people, not, not, I don't do a ton of marriage counseling, I do some, um, but I, I, I see it over and over again, and uh, I, I'll simply call it invalidation. Invalidation is when you find a subtle way to put down the thoughts, the feelings, the actions, the reactions of your spouse. Uh, this is different than disagreeing. This is invalidating. It is to say they don't have a right to feel that way. Uh, this can be for many reasons, but I, I would say, uh, let me tell you a story. There's a, a quite famous uh, counselor in the, I believe it was the 70s, where um, they, they were doing these tests of what uh, uh, if the counselor could predict whether or not the relationship would survive or whether or not the relationship would fail. And in the test, there was this one counselor who had a almost perfect record. It was almost 99% of who he could predict uh, would survive or not. And they were very interested the, the, in the, within the context of the research how he had this incredible record. Most people were just barely better than 50-50 uh, on who would make it and who wouldn't. And he had this crazy record, so they interviewed him. He said this, I looked for one thing, one thing, and that is contempt. He said, if I see contempt, I assume they're not going to make it. The, one of the most dangerous habits that you can get into is this habit of invalidation. They are unworthy of a response. You invalidate them. They don't have a right to feel. They don't have, you are finding ways to put them down. You, 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 you heap contempt. You don't even argue anymore. You just look away with a disgusted expression. It's a bad habit. And every time it happens, it's drawing on that account. And um, it's going to get to a point where all of a sudden you're going to start saying things like, I feel nothing toward them. I'm, I, I don't love them anymore. It's all because this bad habit has reinforced the negative and reinforced the negative and reinforced the negative. Uh, if you are in a relation, if you're in a marriage and you often feel invalidated, you need to talk about that. And you need and you, you need to pray before you do, because it is one of the most dangerous of these bad habits that will wreak destruction in your marriage. And you'll get to a point where you don't want to fix it. You just want to leave. Um, so invalidation is a terrible, terrible uh, habit, a rut that marriages get stuck in. They no longer argue about things. They just retreat into their respective uh, fortresses and heap silent, unspoken insults one on another. You remember how you fell in love? You may not. Most people don't. Uh, let me give you a quick reminder of how you fell in love. You remembered every day what they looked like. And you thought about what it felt like when their hand touched your arm. Don't worry, we're keeping it PG around here. <laughs> um, you, you thought, you dwelt on how they looked in the blue dress or the blue shirt. You thought, you reinforced in your mind the good memories over and over. And you hoped they call. And you re-walked the path of the first date. And what they said, which was so cute, and he was just so funny, and she was just so unmentionable, and it was amazing, and you walked that, that path in your mind, and you reminded yourself of how she looked, and you reminded him yourself of what he, how, how he looked, how he talked, 
And you reinforced, and you reinforced, and you reinforced, and you looked at pictures, and you imagined yourself. You saw the good in them over and 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 over, and you saw it. And one day it wasn't just a crush anymore. You were willing to say, I do, for better or worse, forever. That's how you fell in love. Now, you may not remember it that way because you were probably ignorant about that time. <laughs> I know I was. <laughs> My point is, that's how it happens. That's how love is made. Well, let me say something to you that might be somewhat of a shock to you. Your spouse still has great traits. You just don't think about them anymore. They still have great attributes. You just don't think about them anymore. Instead, what you go through, I'm, not, I'm saying this in an accusatory manner, I don't mean it that way. What the tendency for us to do is instead every day make the list of things we don't like. I don't like her spaghetti. Why can't he wash the car, really? I mean, really, is the sport page that important? The car is filthy. The car hasn't been washed in weeks. Instead of falling in love where you go over and over in your mind, that path of the attributes. And you remember what it is that made you like your spouse. Okay? Now you go over the failings, the failings, the faultings, the faultings, and we wonder why we have a 50% divorce rate. The bishop likes it. I'm glad somebody around here thinks I'm doing good. He's probably just trying to send a hint to his wife, you know, at the... You need to remember the good things that's in your spouse, the things that you admire. And when you catch yourself on running down a list of things you don't like, you need to stop yourself and say, wait a minute, there's some things I do like. And if you'll do that and you'll go back over in your, if just like you did when you fell in love, it'll be different because the years change us all. And not always necessarily for the good either. But it'll be, it, it can still be a, a way in which you keep your heart tender and soft with, with affection and love toward, some, toward your spouse rather than just running down the list. Now, I'm off the notes, but I'm getting back on them right now. Okay, the first one was escalation, this rut of escalation. Every time something happens, you can't talk about it like adults. You explode, fireworks, machine guns, trench warfare, nuclear bomb. Uh, the second one is invalidation. How dare they? They don't have a right. I could do better. Honey, I've seen you. You couldn't. I'm just having fun, you know what I mean? It's like, like well, I'm not going to tell that joke again. Uh, anyway, th th that's the second one. Here's the third. Here's the third bad habit, terrible rut. Uh, withdrawal and avoidance. And this is what I took my text from. A man who isolates himself, he can claim all the high language he wants, but at the end of the day, uh, it, is, it is ultimately uh, uh, usually selfish reasons. Now... Uh, before I get into withdrawal and avoidance, let me say this, because I, I, I want to be, be fair, and I cut up a lot, and a lot of times cut up involves humor, which makes the time pass faster, but sometimes um, I take chances in humor. That's what humor is. It's a chance. It's a social chance. And um, if, if I ever misjudge it and you're a little irritated at me, um, I'm sorry. You know, just don't withdraw yourself. Uh, <laughs> Um, I, I do want to say this. There are circumstances where a temporary separation can be for the good. But it is not ever for the good when all you're really doing is um, planning your, your eventual divorce. Uh, a, a, a separation can be good when you need to compose yourself. There's been so much ugliness, so much negativity that you both need some time to compose yourself and restore some sense of self and mutual respect, rebuild some sense of dignity, and then let's start back at a lower temperature. There are circumstances where uh, separation 
Separation can be good. So I'm not, I, I, I'm not in every context against separation. That said, uh, men and women uh, deal with conflict quite separately, but more often than we can divide it by how men and women respond, we respond even more by our personality than we do by any ranking of male or, or female. I would say this, however, men are much more prone to withdraw from... Uh, 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 awkward, uh, tension-filled situation than women are. Uh, women are, are much more prone to, to, to stay and talk it out. There are big ex- exceptions. Uh, but uh, much more prone to stay and talk it out than men are. Uh, so I want to have just a little bit of fun here. And um, I, I want to uh, make uh, an appeal to all of our ladies. And... Um, uh, Maybe you'll have some fun with this. Maybe you won't. It'll be a big flop, and I will have wasted another couple of your minutes. But uh, here's, here's my question. Um, men, or let me start by saying this. Men are not good in situations where they have to figure out things that are unsaid. They're not good. You know why men love sports? Because the rules are clear and decided on beforehand. You got you understand? You understand? Men do really well in situations where the rules are clear and they're decided on beforehand. They're they're really good. I have this football and I'm going to cross that line. You yeah, got that? <laughs> they're good. We 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 can figure that out. It's clear, it's decided on beforehand. But marriage isn't like that. I don't know if you've noticed. Marriage isn't like that. You ladies are good at 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 perceiving rules as a way of divining affection and it's very much a female love language if he loved me he would have seen that I was tired discouraged that's a love language for you because you will do it to us and we don't know what you've just done we just know oh she loves me that's cool you see what I'm saying um, and oftentimes uh, if if you're in a situation and there's this there's this this withdrawal and avoidance. No, you're not speaking. Uh, there's something going on. I, I would make a request of both men and women, but I think it more often would apply to the women. Ask yourself, did my husband know the rules of this expectation, or am I asking him to read my mind? Okay? Um, now, you don't have to do that. But I'm just telling you, most of the men in here just said under their breath, Thank you, Brother Nathan. (laughs) If you want to have a... This is going to... I don't want to offend anybody. I love you. I'll give you seven hugs after church, okay? Um, if you want, if you if you want to do something, it's okay to say, "I would like us to do this," and and he'll all of a sudden have a problem to solve, and then he'll start doing internet research on the various options involved with that. But if 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 he does not know, a lot of times you can be steaming on the inside, and he doesn't even know that y'all are fighting yet. Okay, so ladies, when in doubt, be clear. Can y'all handle that? Uh, Men, running is not usually the answer. All it does is put it off. Uh, So ask yourself, in my marriage... Which one of us is more likely to run and disappear? And which one of us is more likely to pursue? Who's the withdrawer and who is the pursuer? Uh, how does the withdrawal, withdrawal normally happen? And how does the pursuer usually pursue? Uh, is this a negative pattern in our marriage or is this just a personality? Sometimes it's a personality thing and you are the one to decide whether it's healthy or unhealthy because it can be 
essentially healthy because it's a personality you both understand and you both have your methods whereby you reconvene. You understand? But it can be more than that. It can be where it is uh, in to intimacy. It is a killer of intimacy um, and closeness uh, because we're in the habit of withdrawing. Now, um, how am I doing on time? Okay, I need to start moving along. I'm not even off my first page. Uh, if you're in a household where you can cut the tension with the knife, if you're in a household where it is silent warfare, <laughs> where there's just, you won't even look at each other. <clears throat> if you're in a household like that. Um, I don't know how you got there. But I can tell you why you're staying in that situation where you can't even speak to each other. You ready for this? It's because no one in the house, including you, is humbling yourself. Who are you? There is such benefit that comes if we will humble ourselves. It'll cut through three weeks of trench warfare. It'll cut through all of this if you'll just, if you'll just humble yourself. And you say, well, I, 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 I got a list. That's the problem. Somebody needs to humble themselves. If you don't, can't start by humbling yourself to your spouse, you need to start by humbling yourself to the Lord. And you say, how do I do that? You find a place of prayer and you be honest about your heart. It's not a pretty place. And you repent of the stuff you've done wrong. And you repent of your tendency to fall into certain bad habits. And you humble yourself before the Lord. And you say, Lord, I need help down here. I have, I, I have never seen a relationship. There might have been a few. I, I, I don't say that. I, I think most relationships would respond to someone saying, look, let's be honest. We've, we need to do better. I, I want to humble myself. And I want to admit my need to do better. W would, you, would you meet me? Could we humble ourselves one to another? Could we confess our errors and sins and bad habits one to another? Humility is like magic in relationships where people love each other. Um, so withdrawal and avoid, avoidance is a bad habit. It, it can be a personality thing where you have a good system and it's, it's worked out. But it can be more than that uh, where you are, you are damaging your marriage uh, because of this bad habit. And the last one I want to give, um, uh, the, the rut that we can find ourselves in in marriages, is what I'll call negative interpretations. That's where you decide what someone meant by what they said or what they did. You assume the bad about someone. It is a negative interpretation. Um, if, I'll give you an example, and I'll pick on you ladies first, then I'll pick on the men in a minute. Uh, it can be like this. <clears throat> he forgot that we were going to go out to eat tomorrow because he doesn't love me. Okay? I promise you that wasn't the reason. <laughs> he forgot, that's true. But I, I, I promise you, he, it, I, it, it's not because he, he may not appreciate you enough. That's very common. He may not be thankful enough. There's, but I doubt it seriously. He thought to himself, I don't love her. I'm going to no show on the date tomorrow. But this habit of negative interpretations where we create a narrative in our mind where we answer our questions and we put answers in the mouth of our spouse and they haven't even had a chance to defend themselves. It is negative interpretations. Um, it can happen in every... And the same thing is true is, is, is in, with you men. She won't let me go play basketball with my friends, if any of you are still young enough to play basketball. She won't let me go play golf with my friends because she wants to control me. Did I hear some amens from the young men up here? You suckers aren't even married. I don't be hearing no amens from you guys. You can say, oh, me. <laughs> Thanks for the laugh break. I needed something right there. That's right. Uh, 
Um, the, point, the, the, the point is negative interpretation in the sense that you decide what it meant by what they did. And these, these four principles are true not just in, in marriage circumstances. They're also true in friendships. They're also true in family circumstances. They're true in parent-child relationships. They are true in uh, sibling relationships. The, the bad habit of escalating things. Um, beyond the context of importance. You don't get to win every fight. You need to choose the stuff you fight over. If everything is a fight, then you're just an unpleasant person. You don't even know your own values. You just like to fight. Escalation, it can be a terrible habit in any relationship. Invalidation is a terrible habit in any uh, relationship. A fool has no delight in understanding. But the fool's delight is in expressing their own heart. Um, invalidation is a terrible habit to fall into. Withdrawal and avoidance is a terrible habit to fall into. Negative interpretations is a terrible habit to fall into. So um, let me very quickly give you something you might try. If you're in a volatile, if you're in a volatile time of your marriage, or you find yourself exploding one with another, you might you might get some ground rules. Uh, that you both agree would be helpful. Um, and one of those things would be uh, something so simple uh, that it seems so simple, but I'm telling you it really helps, is uh, in the sense that, that you have a one person, only one person is speaking and one person listening at a time. You don't have two people speaking at the same time. You have one person speaking. If you get in a fight and you have this as a problem, someone needs to call a technical foul and uh, go get a anything that serves as the chair. Okay, Go get yourself uh, 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 anything. And whoever has the, 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 the gavel, whoever has the, the, the whatever it is, they get to speak. And the other person has to listen. And this slows it down, and it has ground. There's, it creates ground rules. And so the speaker has the floor. You can cut yourself out a little piece of carpet, and that's the floor. And whoever has the right to speak, they can stand up on the... I'm just having fun with this, but you get the idea. One person speaks, and one person listens at the time. One person at a time. However, one person does not get to have the floor forever or always. Uh, the gentleman from North Carolina will now have two minutes. Uh, I'm having fun with this, but the point is uh, escalating, screaming, or storming out of the room, or uh, assuming they mean bad things, or deciding they don't have the right to speak. All of these are bad habits of, yes, communication and bad habits of relationships. So, if you would like to communicate and you need to lower the temperature, uh, you need to have some ground rules. One person speaks and one person listens, and uh, you are going to communicate. You are not going to problem solve yet, men. Problem solving will come later. Initially, we're going to communicate. Men, we want to solve a problem. I feel like you don't love me. Well, darling, I'll kiss you right now. <laughs> that, that was not the point. <laughs> you know, uh, so the point is, is uh, these are the rules, and I'm just having fun with this, but you get the idea. It forces some discipline in the situation. It lowers the temperature. Um, how, how many of you know how the fuel in a, when they have a nuclear reactor, that nu the, the, the fizzle material in that reactor, it gets so hot that it, it can get out of control hot. It can blow the city up hot. And so the whole point of all of that, literally meters and meters of concrete and steel, is to, is to contain that. And all of the control mechanisms, particularly the control rods that are placed in the, rea the fissile material, they only have one point, and that is to slow the reaction down. If it happens slow enough, you can use very dangerous material if it happens slow enough. Are you guys getting what I'm trying to say? You can talk about dangerous subjects if you talk about them in a slow controlled way. But if you let it get out of hand, it's going to blow the city up. You see what I'm saying? The control rods, all it does is slow down the fissile material and make what is destructive useful. If you have awkward subjects, slow it down. So, 
rules for the speaker. You can only speak for yourself. You do not get to read minds. If you have the floor and you're speaking, you can speak for yourself what you think, what you feel. You do not get to decide what the other person thinks or the other person feels. You don't get to go on and on. You have to have uh, a, a kind of a reasonable amount of time. Uh, and then, after you have done all of your speaking at that particular time, which isn't the whole argument, but it's like that, that statement that you're going to make, you stop and you allow the person who is listening to paraphrase what you're trying to tell them. So they now par paraphrase back. This is enforced understanding. You are forcing understanding. So you mean, what you just said is that when I forgot to buy you roses on Valentine's Day, you felt unappreciated and particularly uncherished, and you kind of wish that I'd just fall off a log somewhere and break my toe. Is that what I just got from that? And that person who just spoke then has an opportunity to clarify, yes, I felt unloved and uncherished, and I was really hoping you broke your leg and not your toe. Okay, so now the listener has paraphrased, and you have, through this, this discipline of paraphrase, you have forced understanding. And you now... Uh, will have a chance to, to say how you feel, what you were thinking, make the excuses that may or may not be good enough. It's note on Valentine's Day. <laughs> Bishop got in trouble. <laughs> Darling, the snow was coming down like crazy. You should have walked through two miles of snow and come back with a dozen roses. You said you'd climb the highest mountain. <laughs> ah, you understand what I'm saying. So the person with the floor, they speak for themselves. They don't get to speak for you. They don't get to read your mind. They don't get to figure out what you meant, what you didn't mean. They don't get to go on and on. Then they have to stop and let the listener paraphrase back to them what they're trying to say to them. You've slowed the process down. You've forced understanding onto it. And you do not. And then the speaker or the person who is listening, uh, you have to try to understand the message, not just the words. You have to understand that some things feel true, even if they aren't literally true. So when your wife or your husband feels like, says to you, you never are kind to me. They're not saying you are never kind to me. They're saying it feels like you're never kind to me. So you have to focus on the message. You do not get to uh, refute or argue or rebut until you have paraphrased and you are trying to understand. Uh, then you'll have a chance to speak and you'll be able to say, well, honey, I feel like it's unreasonable when there's 11 inches of snow. I feel like it's unreasonable for you to ask me to go. I could fall and break an arm. And then they would come back. They would paraphrase. They would say, okay, let me make sure I have this right. You felt like that you didn't have to honor Valentine's Day because there was 11 inches of snow. You see how we're going back and forth? This sounds a little silly. I'm not going to I'm not going to lie it sounds a little silly but you would be amazed at the good you can do by slowing down the negativity slowing down and stopping the escalation stopping the invalidation stopping the, res the the explosion where you just walk out and leave and withdraw stopping all of this it's simple things it's so simple but it's simple and it works uh a fool has no delight in understanding, but expresses, only has the joy in expressing his own heart. The magic happens when we really make a commitment to understand, not just be right. And I have a little saying that I say sometimes to myself. I sometimes say it to others. Hopefully I say it more to others than to myself. But it goes like this. 
You get to be right all the time, or you get to be married. You don't get both. <laughs> Let's all stand. <laughs> Thank you, Lord, for your goodness. Thank you for your help in our lives. I pray you would help us all to be people that build honorable lives, show forth Christian love, kindness. In Jesus' name. I thank you for your word. I thank you for your being with us today. In Jesus' name. Somebody say amen. amen. All right. Find someone to say, boy, you needed that tonight. Thank you for watching Apostolic Radio Charlotte. Truth with the power to live it.